thank you so much for having me. I'm really uh, pleased to be here to tell you about some of my projects. And I thought I would tell you a little bit about the work that I do at University of Richmond and how I ended up working on this particular research question. Um, so for many of you who are probably uh, familiar with Richmond, uh, know that University of Richmond is an undergraduate campus. So I do a lot of projects that emphasize opportunities for students to gain hands-on experience in ecology and conservation management. So I don't just work on invasive insects. I work on macroinvertebrates in the James River rock pools. I work on amphibian and reptile conservation. Um, but my two main projects recently have been on invasive forest pests and uh, population dynamics of salamanders. So I'm excited to tell you about some of those projects today. But I wanted to give you sort of a brief background in my uh, Virginia history and how I ended up making the switch from reptiles and amphibians to insects. So I did my graduate work at University of Virginia and um, lived in Richmond actually most of the time while I was doing that project. About half of the year though, I lived in Southwest Virginia out Mountain Lake Biological Station, which is just a slice of heaven if any of you have been up into those mountains or visited uh, Mountain Lake Hotel. It's really a gorgeous location. And while I was there, I was captured by uh, the vernal pools and the amphibian population sort of have a safe haven on top of the mountains there. And I tracked uh, migrations and movements of red spotted newts for five years. After that, I was looking for a bit of adventure and I did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in New Zealand at Victoria University of Wellington, working on an amazing species of reptile they have there called Tuatara. And Jim and I were just chatting that it would be great to do a lunch break science on this amazing um, creature as well. So look out for that if uh, it works out in the future. And so at this point, I had done a lot of population scale kinds of questions, looking at how a particular population, whether it's restricted on an offshore island or in a vernal pool, um, discrete kind of habitat, what determines the characteristics of the organisms there, and how does that particular population um, thrive and, and maintain into the future? When I came back from the Tuatara project, I was looking around Richmond for other projects. Um, my husband also teaches in the chemistry department at University of Richmond. And I met a researcher at Virginia Commonwealth University that was working on the invasion of forest insects. In particular, he was working on a species now called spongy moth, which was previously known as gypsy moth. And so I was like, well, I could work on insects. You know, I'm a population biologist, so I'm really interested in like how species persist and thrive in their environments. And so whether it's conservation of a native species or uh, working to improve um, habitat management in the face of invasive species, I thought this was a good experience to branch out. So I started working on um, spongy moth and, and found some really interesting things about how to study um, it spread over time and, and imagine what it's gonna look like into the future. Because even though this particular species has been in the United States for 150 years, there's still a lot of susceptible forest left in the United States. So in this map, the purple uh, indicates the United States range of um, spongy moth currently. And then in, green, in those dark green colors are all the susceptible forests. So one, major priority has been keeping um, spongy moth out of the Ozarks. I should also say that the new common name is related to the um, characteristics of the agnosses, uh, as you see in this image here, on uh, the trees that have that kind of spongy uh, characteristic. And many of you have probably lived through major outbreaks and defoliation events of this species. And so, like I said, this species has been here for 150 years. It was introduced in Medford, Massachusetts in about 1869 or 1870, and has really slowly crept across the landscape since then, which brings up a ton of really interesting ecological questions. How has this species changed? Why has it moved so slowly? Why did it speed up? And how can we slow its spread to reduce to keep it out of these um, susceptible forests as long as we can. So when I started my faculty position at University of Richmond, I was really focused on thinking about how these invasion front populations changed. In particular, I wanted to know if um, they had undergone evolution in the face of different climates, because now they range all the way from those really you know, hot summers in North Carolina, all the way up to those pretty extreme cold winters in Michigan 
So we collected um, egg masses from across the range and looked um, for whether there were any changes in growth and development in response to extreme temperatures. And then we want to, of course, know how do those changes in potentially the sort of biology and growth and development of the species impact its future spread. Because again, there's still a lot of the United States that can be impacted um, by this particular invasive insect. So for me, starting uh, a new faculty position and, and thinking about undergraduate research projects, um, my mantra Dispar or Spongy Moth was the ideal research species. It was um, easy to raise in experiments in the lab that gave my students hands-on experience raising insects. And it was fairly, quote unquote, easy to rear. So we could um, mix up artificial diet and make basically a wheat germ smoothie for our caterpillars and raise them in individual containers where we follow the growth and development of individual um, insects. Occasionally, we've done things on natural foliage, uh, which is, of course, dependent on the time of year, and we can only do those experiments um, once in the spring. And uh, I get funny looks as I wander around campus with my big clippers um, taking leaves off of oak branches or um, my cups of caterpillars. I get all kinds of funny questions about the things that I buy for my research lab compared to the more um, molecular biology labs. And so this is how I got into starting to work with Emerald Ash Borer because I had a lot of experience in thinking about how we could rear and study spongy moth um, in a research context. And as I'm about to tell you, um, there's a particular reason we want to raise a whole lot of Emerald Ash Borers in the lab, but it is nearly impossible to get wood boring, wood boring insects or wood feeding species to eat artificial diet compared to leaf eating species where we can um, you know, replicate some of those nutrients in an artificial uh, diet. So what I'm gonna tell you about today is why the emerald ash borer um, is become such a problem in such a short amount of time compared to the spread of some other invasive forest insects and what's being done to um, combat and manage the invasion of emerald ash borer, and then where does this artificial diet come into the uh, rearing operations in the lab to study and come up with new solutions? So, as many of you may know, um, emerald ash borer is a fairly new um, species on the scene. Unfortunately, we seem to have an increasing number of invasive species arriving every day um, from the global transportation of goods. The emerald ash borer was originally found in Asia and Russia, and it was first discovered in Michigan in um, 2002. But as I'm going to tell you, um, our ability to detect what's going on this, in this species is severely impacted by a lag in detection or the difficulties we have in, in finding it and, and seeing the early warning signs of it being in some place. So it's thought that uh, emerald ash borer was actually arrived sometime in the 1990s through the transportation of solid wood packing material. And it spreads quite rapidly. Unlike spongy moth, where only the males fly and the females uh, sort of really only crawl around the, the ground or you have some larval ballooning, emerald ash borer adults can fly up to 12.5 miles a day and they can live and mate for six weeks. And a lot of forest feeding insects have sort of long caterpillar stages, but something like spongy moth only is in the adult stage for about two weeks, which is a window of opportunity to mate before it dies. But um, emerald ash borer can uh, live and mate for up to six weeks. And so as you can imagine, the effects have been rather devastating. So from its first detection in 2002, you can see how rapidly um, it spread across the United States. Um, with there was a huge effort to try to stop and slow the spread, as has been done for a lot of other invasive insects. Um, but it's sort of basic biology um, meant that we were fairly defenseless against it spreading around um, rather rapidly. So this is a range map um, from 2000, uh, 2020. And here's the current um, range map today. It's um, as of uh, January, 2021. So it's now found in 35 states. And as you can see in the green areas on this map, um, the range of ash is wider than the current invasive range of the species, but we fully expect that it will um, occupy all of our native ash range in the, the near um, 
future. So why is it so difficult to detect and control and come up with solutions to slow its spread? So this is a, a schematic of the basic life cycle of the adult ash borer. So females lay these individual eggs on the outer surface and in crevices of bark, and they can lay up to 40 to 70 on a single ash tree, which then hatch, and the larvae bore inside to that sort of inner tissue of the tree right under the bark. And then they can feed there for one to two years before they pupate to adults, and then they chew a little hole and then emerge as those flying adults, which again can live for an additional six weeks to uh, disperse and mate and feed on these. Interestingly, compared to some of our other invasive forest insects, these guys are extremely aggressive and indiscriminate in killing healthy and stressed trees. So most the vast majority of trees that um, get infested with emerald ash borer end up dying within two to three years um, after being infested. And all of these symptoms and, and, and damage to this tree is, is relatively hidden. Um, for something like spongy moth, we can see the defoliation before our eyes. We can hear the caterpillars literally munching in the canopy. Um, these guys are hidden away and exceptionally difficult to detect in the early stages. We have aerial traps that we can put out, but we don't have an effective pheromone lure that would draw those adults into traps to allow early detection. And if you go through forests looking for visual surveys, you can really only see these like super declining trees at the very end stages of an infestation. Sometimes you can see these telltale um, two holes, and sometimes you can see a lot of woodpecker damage uh, because woodpeckers love to eat these guys. And some of the other um, uh, traditional ways of um, controlling invasive species, particularly invasive insects, are difficult with emerald ash borer. So things like treatments and insecticides, again, you can't do aerial spraying for these guys because they're hidden underneath the bark. So you have to do individual insecticide treatments to individual trees. It's of course exceptionally time consuming and expensive. We can't really monitor the invasion front because of those trapping concerns. And some of the things like quarantining wood products, uh, which has helped with a lot of other invasive species um, spreads, uh, doesn't work because we're so late in detecting when there are problems. We're only seeing it you know, two to five years after they've arrived at the site when they've already um, killed off all those trees. So what I'm going to be telling you about in the second half of the talk today is the strategy that the USDA is pursuing um, in the face of all these challenges, and that is biological control. Before we transition to talking about biological control, I, I want to answer a few questions that I get when I talk about emerald ash borer. So what can you do? I get a lot of emails from folks who are devastated seeing their ash trees die. And unfortunately, it is fairly um, difficult to do anything to prevent that happening because of the way it moves around and our um, difficulties in early detection. You can treat there. I um, am going to send a link to a bunch of different resources um, for materials about how to handle emerald ash borer infestations. There are insecticides that you can inject in individual high value trees that, that can be effective. And there's a cost share program with the state of Virginia if you have um, big old trees that are, you are looking to protect. Uh, if you have really valuable ash timber, you can go ahead and preemptively harvest and remove those trees to avoid the loss of that income. Um, dead and decaying trees are also part of our ecosystem. So unless there's a safety risk from a tree falling, the general advice is to leave it to remain to decay and, and become part of the uh, natural ecosystem. Because by the time you sort of see that tree dying, it's already an incredibly infested. So racing to remove it isn't going to do anything to um, slow the spread. The biggest thing you can do as an individual for all sorts of invasive insect, insects is don't move firewood. And this is for emerald ash borer and for spongy moth and for spotted lanternfly and Asian longhorn beetle. All of these species um, have life stages that attach to uh, trees and firewood and downwood, 
And then by moving firewood around, uh, we transport those life stages, often without knowledge. Um, so you've seen, probably seen a lot of public campaigns um, called like buy it where you burn it or don't remove firewood. And again, I've linked to some of that material in the document I'm gonna share with you guys. Um, so it's really important if you've ever been to a campsite, you'll see some signs about this, um, buying locally um, for firewood or harvesting wood near your destination, um, buying certified heat treated firewood if you're going to do any moving or transporting um, or just gather the wood on site um, if it's permitted in that particular location. So this is really the single most important thing that you can do as an individual to help combat um, our invasive forest insect. Uh, hopefully Jim has put a link to these uh, resources, to these different uh, departmental offices. I'm not with the Department of Forestry. Forestry. I do a small sliver of Emerald Ash Borer research, but there's a whole um, plethora of information related and folks in offices that are, that are designed to help um, for landowners and, and other interested parties in um, handling Emerald Ash Borer in Virginia. Um, so I'm going to pause there and have the opportunity to take questions if you have any general animal ash borer invasion questions or wonderings about the biology of the species. I think we can guess based on what you've told us, these things are really pretty prolific breeders. So I mean, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that maybe? Uh, sure, yeah. So each female can um, visit multiple trees and lay multiple clutches of eggs. So, you know, just on one tree alone, they tend to lay uh, 40 to 70 eggs. And sometimes they stay right sort of really close to that original tree uh, where they emerged from, but sometimes they, they just first uh, quite far and wide. And most people have never seen an emerald ash borer adult. They're that cryptic and tiny and small, unless you are out there with a tool aggressively peeling back the bark to look for signs of damage, which is of course damaging to the tree unless you have a really strong sense that it um, is already infested. So that um, number of eggs and those sort of lack of natural predators we have here for this species is what makes them so devastating because um, we don't have any kind of population regulation naturally here um, in the United States or Canada. Okay, so we had the question. Uh, so since you indicated that lures don't work well, how do the traveling males find the females? Oh, that's a great question. Um, they definitely do have um, pheromone sensing. We just haven't been able to isolate it and synthesize it and make it synthetically yet. So they, they do have a communication system that we just don't fully understand yet. So for something like spongy moth, it took the Forest Service, I think, close to I don't know, 20 or 30 years to come up with the um, chemistry of the pheromone to develop uh, and then to develop the synthetic um, uh, component that's used in traps um, that you might see some of those milk carton or delta traps with the um, sort of triangle shape hanging from trees. Historically, they actually used to bait those uh, with females themselves. And um, and that's only possible because we have a lab facility that, that would rear um, adult females for, for that use. And then originally they would kind of grind them up and make that pheromone, and then they found a, a synthetic. Um, so I, I think there just hasn't been enough time for us to work that out for Emerald Ash Borer yet. So there's maybe hope, but it's probably gonna come too late for us to make a dent in, in stopping this initial wave of spread. But it could be really helpful in the future because, as I'll talk about next, um, if we're going to manage the species as sort of part of our landscape from now on, um, we might want to be able to know how much we're impacting current levels of larvae in recovering forests. Okay, uh, can you take one more question at this stage, Dr. Grayson? Of course. Uh, do we know why specifically it prefers ash trees over other species? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I do know that it's a specialist in its native range on this family of trees. So it's probably the same reason that, that certain other species uh, specialize versus uh, generalist being sort of a generalist feeder. Um, we have a lot of like pine bark beetles that are specialists on particular um, um, genuses of pine trees, for example. So um, it's consistent with how it acts in its native range as well. 
So I'd just say that's the, bio, the biology of this particular insect, which is interesting because a lot of times we think of invasive species as being wide ranging generalists like spongy moth that eat over 300 different species of trees. Um, other things that are examples of, and that's actually interesting that like sometimes the specialists are more devastating to that particular host. So what comes to mind is chestnut blight or hemlock woolly adelgid where they're own, or uh, Dutch elm disease that specializes on sort of one particular host, but it's devastating to that host. So its impact isn't spread around a lot of different species. All right. Thanks, Dr. Reason. Of course. So that's a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, let's talk about what we can do and sort of what the management strategy on the ground is uh, now that we've sort of come come to the realization that we're not gonna slow the spread or have any sort of um, treatment or, or trapping program that's gonna be effective here. So the strategy that the USDA has decided is one of their uh, main strategies in their toolkit for working with Emerald Ash Borer now, it's called biological control. And you may have heard this for a lot of uh, different other um, invasive species or disease programs. Um, it's a system of using natural enemy enemies to reduce the numbers of a particularly harmful or pet species. And so this is using a parasitoid or a predator or a pathogen or some sort of antagonist or competing species to regulate the numbers of um, the introduced species um, to bring its population sort of back down in control and hopefully have it be not exterminated, but be a non-outbreaking, non-completely devastating part of the ecosystem. Another kind of biocontrol strategy that you may have heard about with um, something like mosquitoes is using genetically modified individuals or sterile individuals that are released to get into the environment to either outcompete or replace um, the species that's causing all of the harm. Now there is sort of this like knee jerk, like, oh my gosh, we can't, you know, what are we thinking? Releasing more individual, more species into the environment. And one of the, the classic examples that's held up as uh, biocontrol gone wrong is the cane toad in Australia from the 1930s uh, that were introduced to control sugarcane beetles. And you know, there was not appropriate testing, there was not appropriate thought, they just were sort of dropped in these fields. It turns out they didn't really like the beetles. Um, the beetles crawled up the sugar cane and escaped them and the toad continued to spread across Australia and call, all, cause all kinds of issues for native predators, for pets, um, for sort of taking over wetlands and outcompeting native amphibians. So this is that's sort of biocontrol of the past. Now it is extremely highly regulated and field tested for non-target effects. And there's an internationally recognized risk assessment process that you have to go through before you can even think about doing field testing on a particular species. Um, so it's a lot more well studied, well used. It's particularly cost effective and has been highly um, efficient in, in the control of a wide range of crop um, pests and pathogens. Um, and so one reason that um, bio control has been really effective is we recognize that we can utilize these um, specialist on specialist interactions to try to avoid these non-target effects on other species. And one of the best systems for these specialist interactions are parasitoid wasps. So you may have heard of parasitoid wasps. These are wasps that inject their eggs or lay their eggs on host species, often a um, caterpillar or other sort of larval insect um, that then grows and develops on that insect and then uses that host individual as uh, its food source when, it's, when it hatches. And this is really widely used in the biocontrol world because these interactions are typically exceptionally specialized, that you typically have um, uh, only one or two species that these wasps um, will lay their eggs on, um, and most insects have some sort of parasitic wasp that um, feeds on it, although many of these are unknown. We, it's a huge area of untapped research. There are thought to be as many as 750,000 different species of parasitic wasps, many that are undescribed to science. Some even think they might rival beetles as um, being one of the most species group 
of insects. And often these interactions are happening and, and we don't even know it. So these are some examples. This is a tobacco hornworm uh, with a um, carrying a bunch of different uh, larvae as from a parasitoid. These are the parasitoids injecting their eggs into um, host caterpillars. And so this, this idea has been, uh, you know, captured Hollywood's attention and, you know, some of the alien movies, right? It's kind of this zombie idea of, uh, you know, this egg hatching out and then devouring and taking over uh, its host. There's even hyperparasitoid systems where parasitoid one here indicated in orange lays its egg in a host insect. And then a second wasp comes in and lays its egg within that egg. And then you have a double sort of hatch out and emergence of the um, wasp larva. So it's just such an incredible evolutionary story about the, how these interactions have developed through coevolution over time. And so we're able to use these specialized relationships and do extensive testing to determine if these parasitoids would provide the biocontrol role in introduced habitats when we have species like the emerald ash borer that are just um, out of control in the United States and Canada. So once the emerald ash borer was identified in Michigan, um, the Forest Service and USDA scientists immediately began contacting collaborating organizations and scouting in China to collect and identify potential parasitoid agents that might be utilized in a um, biocontrol scheme. They found three in that initial effort. And then several years later, there was a more cold tolerant species that was identified in Russia. And they went through rigorous uh, laboratory and field trials to test for non-target effects and to make sure they actually attack the emerald ash borer here like we hoped. So after that period, uh, we now have four parasitoid wasps that are in our arsenal for helping to control the emerald ash borer in the United States. Um, two of these are from the genus Spatheus, uh, Spatheus spalini and Spatheus agrilli. Um, there's uh, another that uh, is particularly useful in when trees are smaller and the bark is thinner. This is called Jocasticus. And then there's actually an egg parasitoid named Obius. So the three um, larger wasps, and these, these guys are still really, really teeny tiny and um, do not have sort of any interactions with humans and pets. Um, they are, are really cued in just to emerald ash borer. The obvious uh, wasp lays its eggs directly in the egg of the emerald ash borer uh, that are laid on the outside of the trees. And the other three actually pierce through the bark with their ovipositor uh, to lay their eggs directly in um, the larvae of the emerald ash borer. So when that happens, then the emerald ash borer larvae itself is replaced by all these teeny tiny um, parasitoid wasp larvae that, that hatch out and then eat the um, emerald ash borer as um, their host. So from those first, uh, they, they moved sort of as quickly as they could to get um, these parasitoid trials up and running. The very first um, test releases happened in Michigan in 2007. And the parasitoid production has wrapped, ramped up ever since to a peak uh, in 2015, where we were releasing over a million wasps a year. Uh, up to 8 million wasps total have been released in over 30 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, you can see that most of these, based on um, the reproductive rate and sort of the ease of rearing of the parasitoids, have been uh, Tetrasticus, which is really effective in smaller, regenerating, um, uh, regrowing ash trees. And then um, Spathius galini and uh, Spathius agrilla well, make up a smaller proportion um, and Obi a good number from Obius. So the um, jury is still out, like scientists are still, this is a very active area of research um, to figure out um, if this is working and um, how long these populations will persist. So in the stands that have been studied in detail, and again, these studies are particularly hard to do because of uh, the difficulty detecting and trapping and monitoring 
um, these WASP releases, but they, they've been doing in-depth studies and in particular stands to sort of make sure this is working um, the way we expect. And so on average in stands that have been studied where EAB have been released, they're seeing about a 76% decrease in the average density of live EAB larvae. And this is uh, thought to have been driven by these parasitoids being released and the helpful addition of woodpeckers helping to um, eat emerald ash borer larvae as sort of generalist predators. So here in green uh, we have and red, we have uh, no parasitoids released. So these were stands where um, none of these parasitoid releases happened. And you can see sort of the up and down of the number of EAB in that particular stand. And then with all of the parasitoids released were released here in black, uh, you can see the decline of that growth rate of emerald ash borer larvae. Um, it's comparison to um, when um, just a subset of the parasitoids were released. So it seems like uh, Spathius galini here had a particularly large impact um, in the response of this particular stand. So it's great that we can uh, release them and see some of these reductions, but you know, we don't want to be releasing these wasps every single year because the, the last part of my talk, I'm going to tell you sort of what goes into this um, production and the, and the research I'm doing to try to help uh, that process along. Uh, what we would like is to have the parasitoids that get released remain alive and then continue breeding and um, year after year continue killing emerald ash borer. Because if we want to start replanting ash trees, we want to feel confident that these parasitoids are out on the landscape and are doing their job to keep emerald ash borer not exterminated, but in check so that those trees on a whole can grow and survive and we can have some balance. Um, so in this map, you can see the counties in yellow that have had these experimental uh, releases happen. And then the ones with the black dots are where um, they've gone back and seen the parasitoids remain over time. So sometimes you release the parasitoids and either the conditions aren't right or there might not be enough emerald ash borer still there for them to grow and thrive. Maybe it's a detection issue. All of this is still um, being actively investigated, but at least we have some indications uh, that some of these sites, particularly in Michigan um, and up in Northern Virginia and DC, the Fairfax County folks have been really active in working on this issue. Um, we've seen some good signs that, uh, that these parasitoids are remaining. So that's the good news. Hopefully the optimism that, that maybe we can return um, some rebalance to um, forest stands and get ash back out there on the landscape. If you think about how long it's been coming to see American chestnut uh, reintroduced on the landscape, I, I think this is incredibly um, fast science that has happened uh, to help manage this issue and, and think about how um, we can uh, maintain these ecosystems and, and still have ash on the landscape. And ash is all over, um, particularly in the Midwest, it was a really popular tree that was planted as subdivisions went in because it was strong and beautiful and fast growing and provided um, some really nice ornamental trees as well as its importance in, in forest landscapes. So what does it take to raise 8 million wasps? And so this is the part of the research that I've gotten to participate in. And so I'm really excited to tell you about what we're working on to try to increase this effort because we can't um, we would love to blanket the entire eastern United States with these um, parasitic wasps, but it is an exceptionally expensive and time-consuming effort. Um, so what you need is you need the emerald ash borer larvae to start mass growing these parasitoids. And so to get the emerald ash borer larvae into logs, you have to start with the adults. Um, so the first thing the um, biocontrol facility in Michigan does is it goes out and finds ash trees that are infested with emerald ash borer already and bring them back to the lab. And interestingly, because emerald ash borer has been so devastating and moves so fast through Michigan, they actually now have to go into Wisconsin. So this lab is you know, going on extensive um, scavenge and salvaging operations, trying to find um, logs that have active emerald ash borer larvae in them so they can 
harvest those trees, bring them back to the lab. They put them in these big cylinders here in sort of large chunks. And they seal them up and put these little plastic vials um, attached to a funnel. So when the emerald ash borer adults emerge, they get trapped in this little vial, but then they can be collected and lay eggs um, to start the process of the parasitoid life cycle. Um, so this is the first thing that this lab would really like to get rid of, having to source wild wood to have these emerald ash borer adults to lay eggs. Because remember, once the larvae start growing in a log, it takes one to two years before those adults emerge. So right now it's more efficient to get the larvae from um, natural wood where those trees were gonna die anyways. So once those adults emerge, then you have to feed them to get them to lay eggs and the adults feed on ash leaves. Um, so in Michigan, uh, during some parts of the year, they have greenhouses where they can get the ash leaves in other parts of the year, they're actually um, having greenhouses in Puerto Rico send them fresh leaves twice a week so that they can feed these adults emerging that then lay eggs on coffee filters that they can harvest and um, start growing the larvae in bolts. And I just found this fascinating. Like I never really thought about all these details uh, about how to maintain an entire insect life cycle in the lab when in the field, we're just being devastated and destroyed by something that, that might seem so easy to rear, but all these different specialized points in the life cycle um, need to have different food requirements, different temperature requirements, and working all that out took quite a long amount of time. So after those insects lay eggs on the coffee filters, the coffee filters are cut up. So they have additional ash uh, saplings that they're sourcing from greenhouses um, that they cut into what they call bolts, these little tiny sections of ash tree and then these coffee filters are placed all around the top of these ash bolts. And then they hatch and the larvae bull burrow in to this ash bolt um, and they grow and develop and go through their life cycle. And so as you can imagine, this is also fairly intensive. You've got to, there's a lot of work that went into making sure these ash bolts and mold um, that they were maintained under the right temperature and humidity for these guys to uh, start growing. So now a couple months later, after you've gotten these emerald ash borer larvae to grow, then you can bring on the uh, parasitoids. And so they collect the parasitoids. One of the most time consuming pieces, and this really surprised me, is they actually peel back that initial layer of bark um, to expose the emerald ash borer larvae directly to the wasps to maximize the hit rate, to maximize that every single one of those exceptionally valuable larvae get parasitoid, get parasitized by these wasps. So just to give you some context, this is the size of these wasps here. They're super teeny tiny, almost like the size of a fly, uh, not sort of the, the wasps that you might be um, used to seeing. Here they are right here. Kind of look like a, you know, you almost think they look like an ant from a distance or something. So they're really, really small. So these um, ash bolts are peeled, the wasps are brought in uh, to lay their eggs or they're, uh, in the case of Obvious, they're laying their eggs directly on the emerald ash borer eggs themselves. And then um, these larvae um, hatch and start feasting on uh, the emerald ash borer. Those are then um, put into cold storage um, because this operation is happening year round. But of course, in the field, they can only release these insects during certain times of year. Um, so literally, they just ship out these bolts that have these wasp larvae ready and waiting inside to do their thing when it gets warm enough for them to hatch. And these bolts are then attached to trees in the field. And then the wasps emerge and hopefully go find uh, and attack um, the field and all dash borers that are out in the field. And so this is what the biocontrol facility in Michigan has been doing for the last decade uh, to ramp up production of these wasps to get them out into the field. It's incredibly time consuming, um, expensive. There's, I think, 11 full-time people that work at this facility and just their um, sheer numbers that they're able to produce is, is staggering. So the work uh, that I've been doing is trying to figure out ways to simplify and um, economize and really ramp up 
this production um, so that more laws can be produced at lower cost and without that reliance on natural wood. Unfortunately, wood boring insects have really specific dietary requirements, and that makes it really difficult not only for finding a diet that's nutritionally um, equivalent to what they would get from the wood, but has the right texture for their mouth parts uh, to uh, feed on that, that tissue. Um, so the diet itself has to be a lot more rigid um, and have a lot more structure compared to uh, the diet that you saw earlier in the talk that we could just pour from a blender in the lab uh, and make like a little um, uh, slurry for them. So just a, a quick look at what this looks like. Um, so we have lots of different ingredients that have been tested over the last 10 years and trying to find the most nutritionally complete diet. Um, those get mixed up um, with some components that give it some of that texture and cohesion. Then it's dried um, because to mix and sort of get those nutrients all um, distributed throughout an artificial diet, you need something kind of liquidy, but these guys need something harder to eat. So it's dried for a long time. We roll it out into sheets. And right now we're trying a system where we sandwich it between two pieces of plexiglass, almost like an ant farm. So we can actually see the emerald ash borer larvae um, uh, digging in as, as it eats. One of the most difficult things we had to work with was getting the eggs to hatch and then having enough tension where the recently hatched larvae can burrow into that artificial diet and start feeding and making its tunnels. And this is um, what some of these test plates look like um, where we store them in like little file holders and in incubators for different temperatures under different light conditions trying to find that magic formula that allows insects to, to complete their life cycle within this artificial diet instead of wood. The next stage that we've just reached in this project is also once we've got that larvae grown up, um, can we present it to the wasps and have the wasps um, not uh, still cue in on the, the emerald ash borer larvae, even though it's not in wood um, and oviposit into the diet um, successfully. So we've actually been undergoing those trials the last couple of months, um, which has been really exciting um, and frustrating because we try all sorts of different materials and um, storage sites. Right now we're actually 3D printing um, some uh, trays. So our, our main goal right now is to um, get eggs infested and get them up to that fourth instar on diet. So we only have to get them big enough so that the wasps um, can go ahead and lay their eggs in them. And in the lab, we can keep the temperature warm enough so that we can cut that down to a couple of months instead of one to two years. Um, I've learned a lot about kind of restaurant grade um, cooking equipment. Uh, and right now we're looking at um, almost industry grade uh, cooking materials. Um, and there's a piece of equipment called an extruder that sort of mass produces mixed and pressed ingredients um, that we're looking at as our uh, ideal sort of mass production for um, improving the texture and cohesion of our diet ingredients. And then, like I said, we're putting the diet itself um, in with the, the sort of fourth instar larvae in these containers and then adding the wasps um, to see if they will successfully lay eggs in larvae. And then once they do, since we won't have them in a stick of wood anymore. What are the methods we need to work out to ship them um, out into the field so that the uh, larval wasps can then successfully um, survive the trip and um, hatch in the natural habitat? So that's kind of a snapshot of the, the work I've been doing recently uh, and the sort of contribution of understanding how to lab rear these guys to support the biocontrol program for Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, here at University of Richmond, it's a really great experience for my students to get to go to this lab and um, participate in uh, this research, but all the hard work happens in Michigan at the Biocontrol Lab, which is run by Ben uh, Slager. Hannah Nadal and Mari Hicken are my collaborators at a different USDA lab who are some nutritional gurus in thinking about what kinds of different diet ingredients. And Alan Cohen at NC State has worked on this project as well. And these are our current um, uh, students who are working on this project. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.
Okay, Dr. Grayson. Uh, so it looks like based on the pictures we've seen of the damage that these insects do, that they're just consuming just that layer of wood that's just underneath the bark. Is that correct? That's right. It's not sometimes how the cabrium or the phloem and sort of what they're uh, eating along, and that cuts off the um, nutrient transport system of the tree. So that's where um, those uh, nutrients would be transported from uh, nutrients and water from soil all the way up to the leaves. And then by cutting off that nutrient transport system in trees, uh, the tree uh, can't support its leaves anymore and dies. Okay. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how successful they've been in kind of establishing uh, kind of natural populations of these parasitoid wasps? Yeah, that's the sort of million dollar question. And uh, I think one of the, what do you call it, uh, bottlenecks in uh, making the strategy uh, feasible into the future is that in some cases you release them and, and nothing happens, right? They um, go locally extinct and, and don't um, uh, continue over time. So I, I think there, I, I can't pull the, the stats off my top of my head on how many uh, sites, because not all the sites where they release, are they able to do in-depth monitoring um, for service departments that request these. And, and right now you can't request these as an individual. They all go to state for forestry offices that agree to do at least some baseline monitoring um, after they release them. Um, but sometimes they can't do the sort of in-depth monitoring um, that you might like if you had unlimited resources and time, because a lot of these offices also have a lot of other forest management issues on their plate. Um, but they have done some studies on um, dispersal, showing that they do um, move away from that initial release site and colonize other sites. Um, the larger wasps, um, the spathius ones, have been shown to move a little further than the egg parasitoids. Um, the obvious uh, species. And again, we're really hampered by the ability to survey and detect what's going on in the wild um, after these release events, both with Emerald Ash Borer and with the wasps themselves. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this one or not. Uh, we have uh, one of our guests in the UK uh, saying they have something called ash dieback in the UK. And they're wondering if it's caused by something similar. That's a great question. I don't think emerald ash borer is in the UK, as far as I know. Um, it might be pathogen related, but I, I would have to look that up. All right. I don't see anything else popping up in the chat, so we will go ahead and bring it to a close for today. Uh, so uh, I could thank inject one last thing. If you're really interested in this topic, check out um, the Emerald Ash Borer University YouTube channel. Um, it's not just Emerald Ash Borer, but a whole bunch of other different forest insects. So you could see seminars like this that have been recorded and uh, are out there. Um, also like really detailed research talks where people go through all the different uh, components of the system. I tried to give more of a general overview uh, today, but if you're interested in digging deeper, I highly recommend um, those seminars as well. All right, uh, once again, thanks very much, Dr. Christine Grayson for being here today, great presentation. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at the opening, uh, this will be the final uh, Lunch Break Science that we will be doing via Zoom. Uh, we will be returning live to the Miss Barbara Tallheimer Theater here in the Science Museum of Virginia. Uh, so that will be Wednesday, April 6th. And our speaker will be uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman. He is the David and Jane Cohn scientist here at the Science Museum of Virginia. And he will be presenting Taking the Earth's Temperature. Again, that's April 6th at noon. Uh, and you can just simply come right into the museum on uh, April 6th before noon and uh, come in for the talk. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for being here.